staggering sum of $9 trillion to the global economy. Uganda also faces the threat of the emerging variants which are proving difficult to treat with vaccines. To our audiences watching us through the conventional channel and those online, good evening and welcome to Citizen Voices. We have a panel of experts to interrogate this veritable subject of vaccines, including the Minister of Health, Dr. Honorable, Ruth, Dr. Honorable Jane Ruth Cheng Ochero, who has been at the forefront of combating the COVID-19 pandemic, and a senior program officer, Saudi Zawanainchi Maria Nanyanzi, whose organization recently conducted a study on knowledge, attitude, and perceptions on the COVID-19 pandemic, and last but not least, Dr. Mesach Wayengera, who chairs the Scientific Advisory Committee on COVID. But before we come to speak to our panel experts this evening, we are going to sound out Vox Pops. These are opinions which were taken on the streets of Kampala about perceptions on this subject of COVID-19. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ruhamu Arthur Sande, and um, COVID-19, the standard operating procedures, uh, where I come from and the different areas I've been to, in the start, initially people used to wear masks, sanitize, and wash hands. However, of late, when I enter certain markets, I don't see these things happening. When I enter certain places, uh, people have relaxed a little bit about it. So I think the government should do more sensitization because initially when the sensitization was high, everybody was doing this. However, I feel like the SOPs have helped reduce on the risk of uh, spreading COVID-19 to a high level because I've not really seen high death like the one I'm seeing in India and other countries. Uh, but I also have a question for the ministry. So since we started rolling out the vaccine, when do they think, when do you anticipate the whole process to be complete when every Ugandan has a dose? And when this happens, shall we go back to normal? Shall we have the bars open? Shall we have businesses open? Shall we have all the sectors closed, the curfew done away with, which I hate so much? Will this happen after the vaccination is done and in which period of time? Sanitizing should be regularly here and it helps you to clean the germs off your hands. So I believe these SOPs have helped and uh, someone stands a chance not to actually contract this virus. For example, in Fort Porto, they used to have very many, very many, very many COVID cases, but right now they've reduced, and people are not putting on masks. That's just right there, that's just this previous weekend. So I think the government should uh, push for them because they are necessary. Then my question to the government is, I mean, okay, uh, the vaccine, does it really work? What is the procedure of uh, getting it? Because I'm sure people don't know how to get it uh, out there. Many people, many people are going for the vaccine, yes, but some people don't know where to get it. So what is the procedure of getting it? And uh, should they also make it minimal, at least, so that there is nothing like a long line or a long process of getting it? My thought on SOPs, I think the Ministry of Health is doing a good job. We really appreciate. Thank you, Honorable Minister Jen Rutha Cheng. I think the SOPs are working for us, and I encourage all Ugandans to keep wearing masks and washing their hands and sanitizing. Uh, my question to you, Honorable Minister, is uh, when school children are getting immunized, uh, very many children are apparently at school and I think very many of them have not yet gotten immunization. Hi, so my name is Kelly and personally I have strong belief and faith in the SOPs and uh, everyone being able to observe them. But unfortunately from the conversations that we have with peers and workmates and everyone, you'll hear that some of them don't take them so seriously, especially the vaccination bit. So my question to the minister, how, how, how are you, what are you going to do in order to reverse this sort of mentality and negativity around the vaccination? Mr. Joseph, I am the honorable minister. 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 I am the honorable 
bafuna bafuna ndwa de studies mu in case nga baba era baba banzo bagema nika tuwe tusaba njaga minister kutu approve ngini ndagale elio tibova olie kuviza uh, disadvantage chi dididata kumuviri go I have one question for the minister concerning the the contact numbers that have been shared why are those numbers not available my mother was recently vaccinated and she tried to contact those numbers but was not able to get any number to advise her i am concerned about our senior citizens who are not able to get a device please make the numbers available <laughs> Good evening, viewers, uh, once again, or those of us who are watching us uh, this evening from every pocket of the country. This is the Citizen Voices, and uh, we have a panel of uh, three guests this evening, the Honorable Minister, uh, Senior Program Officer, and an expert. First things first, Honorable Minister, we've just commemorated the World Immunization Day, which aims to promote the use of vaccines to protect the young and the elderly. To put it candidly, we've heard stories that Uganda is becoming more or less the hotbed uh, of some of these variants. Uh, we've uh, registered cases of the South African variant and the India variant, which has burrowed across the landscape in India and left a trail of despair and death. Um, how widespread are these variants, Honorable Minister, in this country? Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me to come and uh, have a discussion with the citizens. Allow me first of all to appreciate the citizens for expressing the questions that they have and the doubts that they have. It is good because then uh, they are seeking for answers and that is what we expect from the citizens of Uganda. And so I really must say I am very proud of them because if they were not asking questions, I would be wondering whether they are really on board with us or not. So this actually shows that the majority of the Ugandans are following very seriously what is happening and they are keen to know and to understand. Yes, in the country, um, our laboratories, just like many other laboratories world over, have been uh, very keen on carrying out what we, what we call genomic sequencing, you know, looking at the virus, because viruses naturally in their life, and uh, the chair of the scientific committee can explain a little more if people want to know, they try, first of all, we are the host. And they don't want their hosts to know them and get rid of them. So they keep on changing their, 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 their structure so that they elude the host. And uh, so this happens to all viruses. And this particular one, I mean, a world over, the scientists knew they would change their, their structure and they have been doing it. And so scientists follow up to see what they will change to and if what they will change to will be a weaker virus or a more virulent virus. And what has happened with uh, the COVID-19 virus is that the new variants that are coming up are actually more aggressive, more easily transmissible, and they don't only affect a certain age group, they actually affect all age groups. We do have about five variants in this country uh, that have been recorded from sequencing about 399 samples uh, from people, majorly people who came into the country, either the truck drivers or who came in through the airport. And uh, out of that, we discovered that uh, we have the South African variant we have a variant from India that we got in one of the patients uh, from Molago. We also have the Nigerian variant uh, with us. We also have the United Kingdom variant. And we have a variant that, you know, it's, so its original place is here in Uganda, the Ugandan variant. 
We don't know the behavior of these variants here among our population. That is still being studied. And once the scientists have studied it together with the epidemiologists out there in the field, then we shall inform the population accordingly. Thank you very much, Honorable. Um, to come to bring uh, our senior program officer from South Zawanenji, you recently conducted a research and we want you to glean some of that data so that we can interrogate those figures from your field research. What was the purpose and what are the findings from your study that you recently conducted in three districts? Thank you, Emma, and thank you for hosting us. Um, so the research that we conducted was done in 20, uh, this year, in January. This came from uh, a research that we had earlier conducted in May last year as we were getting into the lockdowns. And at that point, when we shared that data with uh, some members from the Ministry of Health and also the Risk Communication Pillar of the National Task Force, it was quite uh, evident that they, there was a need to get more information on what is happening at the points of entry and then what is happening in Kampala, which is the center for most of the business in Uganda. So we zeroed down on three districts, that is Kampala, Chotera, and Toro. We wanted to know what, is the, what are the awareness levels, what, uh, what do citizens think about the different SOPs, what is it that they think about the government's uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And at that point in time, when we collected that data, we noticed that the awareness levels of the COVID-19 virus had actually gone up. That is in uh, January. Because back in April, the awareness levels we established were about 90%. And that meant that about 10% of our population was still very, was not aware of the COVID-19 virus. And we noticed that this was in uh, areas of Karamoja, West Nile, uh, the Central Region, Central 2, and also Teso Region. So uh, the results that we shared at that point in time were able to really show that there was a need to drum up the campaign on COVID-19, the signs, the symptoms, and then the SOPs. So in this research that we conducted in Chotera, Kampala, and Tororo, we went further to understand what is it that uh, the citizens know about the confirmed cases of coronavirus in their district. We did see that um, between January this year and then July last year, the awareness levels have, um, have remained fair. In Kampala, we saw that around August last year, that is July, about 57% said that they were aware of the number of confirmed cases in Kampala. Then 85% said that they were aware of the confirmed cases in Chotera, and a higher percentage of 92% were aware of the confirmed cases in Tororo. Then come January this year, this number has slightly dropped. That is the level of awareness of confirmed corona cases within the districts. But when we ask the question of, are you aware of the, uh, the number of confirmed uh, COVID cases within your village, we did see that now this number has actually gone up. That is between July and um, January this year. In Kampala, for example, back in July, August, 5% said they were aware of the confirmed uh, COVID cases in Kampala. And then come to January this year, this number had shot up to 17%. Uh, A similar pattern we are seeing in Chotera and Tororo. So maybe the question here would be, why is it that the numbers at the village level are shooting up? That is, those that are aware of COVID cases within their village is going up compared to the numbers that, they are, that say that are aware of the COVID cases at the district level. Is it that this information that they get at the village level is really based on word of mouth, that there are a lot of rumors, and that carries with it a lot of... Uh, misinformation or disinformation around the coronavirus because when you try and uh, look for that information at district level, I think it's a little bit difficult and we have to rely on the custodian of health in this country for that information. So um, maybe we can get to know more about that later. Then we also did see that um, in terms of the, uh, the people, the percentage of households, that have taken corona 
uh, virus test, this number also remains uh, fairly low. About two in 10 households have taken those tests in Kampala, Chotera, and Toro. This we definitely cannot um, fault anyone because we know it, had, it comes with a huge cost. But then we also do see that when it comes to um, what happens to the citizens, what do they do when they say they suspect that there is a COVID case within their locality? What is the first thing that, uh, who do they turn to? We do see that the majority say that they visit a health center first. At some point, we used to hear that that is really not the first thing that people should do. They should call the corona hotline. In August last year, about 58% said that they would call the corona hotline first. That is in Kampala. But come January this year, this number has gone to a 22%. So what does this pose a risk for the health workers? Because majority of the residents of these districts say their first action will be to run to a health center. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, thank you for that research. We'll be interrogating that much later. But uh, let me come back to Honorable to speak about uh, s still the subject of, uh, no, let me uh, go to the experts, sorry. Uh, to speak about the subject of uh, variants. Dr. Wayengera, you chair the Scientific Advisory Committee on COVID, and like Honorable has said, variants may be harder for immune systems to detect. They may be trans more transmissible. They are quite, they can grow rapidly and can become the dominant strain. Does our local vaccine working group, has it conducted any studies on the efficacy of AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, which is the only vaccine that we have in the country in light of combating the COVID-19. Thank you, Emma. Um, good evening, viewers. Um, I, th I think the, the key question is that um, we, we, sh we, we need to appreciate is that we are not isolated. Uh, we not working in isolation as a country. Uh, Uganda is uh, part to uh, the guidelines that WHO issues. And uh, two things happen before a vaccine comes in here. Uh, that, WH that, that vaccine has to be accredited by the WHO. But at the same time, the vaccine also has to be accredited by the National Drug Authority of Uganda. So uh, given the fact that we were in an emergency situation, many of the vaccines received what we call emergency use licensia, both from the WHO and the NDA. So our vaccine uh, committee and the NITAG uh, uh, undertaking ongoing studies in partnership with different partners, the WHO, uh, looking out for efficacy and looking out for side effects. And uh, we review this data uh, as a, almost on a weekly basis. And uh, at in if we see any indication that uh, the vaccine does not work, we should be able to intervene. But for now, uh, from the data that we have globally, we know the vaccine works. Uh, one of the things, the myths that I probably need to do away with was the famous study that was done uh, in South Africa, which was evaluating the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, against the South African variant. Uh, that study actually showed that uh, vaccination with AstraZeneca did not stop uh, primary infection with the South African variant. And, uh, but the study also showed that the people who acquired the disease only progressed to mild and moderate disease. And that's one aspect that is not well captured about this study. When we give a vaccine, there are two reasons why we give a vaccine. 
Number one, either to primarily protect somebody against uh, infection uh, or to prevent uh, the emergency of severe disease in case somebody is uh, exposed. In our case as Uganda, vaccination is part of our resurgence plan. We know very well that we do not have the capacity to handle a situation like is happening in India. In fact, it, it would be delusional for anybody to think we can handle such a situation. Uh, India is the place where we have been referring our very sick people. So you would say India has a more advanced health system than we are. So for us, when we decided to plan for a possible resurgency, vaccination was part of the resurgency plan. And the idea is that if we vaccinate the vulnerable groups, uh, the frontline health workers, we will reduce the number of people that uh, fall severely ill and require intensive care or HDU dependency. Thank you. I think that's very important for our audience, what Dr. Wayengera has shared with us, that AstraZeneca actually causes just mild reactions, just like other vaccines. And um, it's much more important to take this vaccine than, you know, to fear, because uh, if we get the Indian situation in this country with a much more strained health system, it could be quite dire. That's when I bring in the Honorable Minister once again. We are now at the budgeting process, and uh, we know that the economy has been plunged into a tailspin as a result uh, of COVID-19. But um, in this sense, the health of citizens should come first. How can we sound out that clar clarion call to ensure that, I mean, the health budget gets the lion's share this time round? Um. You are absolutely right that health comes first. And uh, allow me to stress to the citizens of this country that the government of Uganda prioritizes the health of its citizens. And at any one time, whenever there is a challenge, it is a top priority for the government to address. And that is why the government came in very strong right from the top leadership of His Excellency the President during this time of the pandemic uh, to respond to the bigger challenge that was in the country. And you will appreciate that His Excellency puts in his time and thoughts and everything at his disposal to ensure that the citizens of this country are protected against COVID-19. Similarly, during the budgeting, health is always among the top priority um, ministries that is considered. Definitely, as you clearly mentioned, there has been a lot of economic challenges with COVID-19, not only in Uganda, this has been a global uh, big challenge and uh, the economic turndown has uh, affected nearly all the countries in the world. So Uganda is not unique. However, again, health has been prioritized and that is why government put aside funds to procure adequate vaccine for all its citizens. And I want to stress here that COVID-19 vaccines in Uganda are free, up to date. It is free for the eligible population, except that we are prioritizing population groups beginning with the most vulnerable and we will move down up to uh, the last age group, which will be 18. Not only is government providing funding for vaccines and the processes, but government and partners supported the first 
response plan, which was for the first wave. Now we are at the foot of a resurgency. That is what we call it, but the majority of the people there will understand if I say a second wave. And we have already uh, developed a response plan for the second wave. Yesterday I communicated that the response plan requires 290.2 million US dollars. Government is also mobilizing resources for this response plan. And there are many huge drivers for this heavy budget, especially surveillance and uh, laboratory costs, including costs of personal protective equipment for the health workers. So all this government is putting into consideration. However, we must also be aware that essential services for all the other disease conditions also continue. It is not only about COVID. Essential care is still required. People with heart diseases still have it and they are getting care. People with cancer still need care. People are still getting malaria and all the other diseases and they still need care. And all these services are still going on concurrently with services for COVID-19. Uh, 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 we're going to take a commercial break, but we'll be back to address um, the other topics, for instance, myths, perceptions, the vaccine rollout uh, program, and many other issues. Good evening viewers and welcome back once again. This is the Citizen Voices and we have a panel of three experts. Uh, we have the Health Minister, we have an expert from the Civil Society and an expert uh, from the medical field. Um, coming to our Civil Society expert, at the in March when COVID, when the COVID pandemic burrowed across this country, we saw quite a robust campaign but we seem to have scaled down and we seem to have gotten to a level of complacency. What could be driving this and what are your findings in the study that you conducted? Thank you, Emma. So um, from the study that we conducted, we did see that uh, citizens, residents of the three districts say that the COVID messaging has significantly gone down, especially in Kampala, seeing about 60% saying that they do agree that they don't see as much of the COVID messaging anymore. And then we also do see that um, they still insist that the daily briefings from the Ministry of Health are very relevant, but they do not seem to see those because they help to dispel the misinformation, the fears around COVID-19. But also additionally, we asked a question around the vaccines. In January, we wanted to know, are they willing to take the vaccine? And we did see that in the three districts, there was high willingness to be vaccinated with 74% in Kampala saying that they'll be willing, 83% in Chotera, and then 89% in Tororo. But then we also did see a few that were saying that they would not be willing to take the vaccine, but this is because they thought this would come at a cost. Only about 3% said that they would not be willing to take the vaccine because of issues of trust. So the question would have as civil society or as Taweza or as the citizens, why is it that between February and March, we are hearing stories of less um, citizens going in to get vaccinated? Is it connected to the low awareness levels on uh, COVID messaging? at this point in time, and what is it that our duty bearers have to say about that? Dr. Wayengera, to bring you in, um, vaccine distribution can be a logistical nightmare sometimes, but um, going by the figures, um, we seem to have a low, a kind of low vaccination uptake recorded so far, and there are fears that some of these vaccines may expire. 
And um, we've also registered uh, this concern that actually even the young health uh, medical workers are reluctant to take the vaccine. This could have uh, perhaps a domino effect on the rest of the population. Um, is it an issue to do with the sensitization campaign? And what can we do to ensure that each citizen um, is aware about the dangers of being reluctant to take this vaccine, which is life-saving? Thank you, Emma. Um, I, I think it's um, vaccines, like any other technology or product, uh, it's a process. It's a gradual process uh, when you have a new technology, for example, the, the, the COVID vaccines, uh, to take root in, in the community. And there are many barriers to uh, this, some of which uh, 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 Maria attempted to address uh, through her questionnaire. But from the data that we see coming from uh, uh, the survey that was conducted in Kampala, Tororo, uh, it, it is clear that in the case of Uganda, the, the slow uptake uh, which we had initially is not because of lack of awareness. Uh, clearly, I think uh, the study demonstrates that there is high awareness uh, about the vaccine, and uh, it's not also lack of acceptance. Uh, people are willing to take the, the vaccine. Rather, from our point of view, what we think was, has been the problem is uh, a lack of uh, potential access. And uh, when we started off, uh, we had some logistical challenges. And uh, as, at, as the ministry, we've been working around to make sure that we address some of these uh, logistical challenges, including decentralizing uh, vaccine uh, distribution to the uh, lowest health centers so that uh, people uh, can easily access them. Uh, we have so far engaged several stakeholders, including the health workers. Uh, more recently, uh, as part of, again, the resurgence plan, we are activating the district task forces. Uh, the minister was meeting uh, the other DCs, uh, I think, the day yesterday. And uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is make sure that the districts working with the DHOs, uh, the other DCs working with the DHOs are able to ramp up uh, the vaccination uh, so that we do not uh, lose these vaccines. I want to assure Ugandans that um, from what we've seen starting from th this week, uh, it is actually worrying us that the, the remaining doses of vaccines might uh, get finished very quickly. So if you are out there and you, th you are in the category of uh, people that need this vaccine, kindly go out and access it uh, when it's still available. Thank you. Uh, Honorable, uh, you mentioned that uh, we are now at the second phase of a disease outbreak. Um, and this is serious. But as you are aware, there are a number of conspiracy theories about these vaccines and they've gained traction even in elite societies like America, the, the rural, white rural conservatives have rejected the vaccine. So we, have, we definitely have challenges here in Uganda. What are we doing to debunk some of these uh, conspiracy theories? Uh, first of all, Emma, we are not yet uh, in, the midi in the middle of uh, the second wave. We are at the foot, okay. just beginning the second wave. But it's extremely important for people to know that the standard operating procedures still work. Even when you have not accessed a vaccine and gotten a dose, just following the SOPs are still protective. Yes, there are many conspiracy theories surrounding the vaccines, and uh, they are mainly uh, fabricated by a group of people that I have I found a very good name to describe them. They are WhatsApp scientists. <laughs> and uh, they, 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 they want to know much more than the actual scientists know. 
So they develop their theories and they, you know, push forward their theories. And unfortunately, they are more appealing to the population than the actual scientists. Because people don't like reading, you know, uh, well-written scientific papers that actually tell them the truth. They want to read those small, small extracts from the WhatsApp scientists. Yes, there is a lot that needs to be done by Ministry of Health, our scientists, as well as uh, our public relations officers to demystify the conspiracy theories surrounding the vaccines. And we have developed what we call a question and answer uh, fact sheet uh, to, to try and help people out there. We are disseminating this as far as possible. The RRDCs have it because the RRDCs, who are the chairs of the district task forces, work together with the DHOs. The DHOs also have. So what we do, just like um, the citizen's voice, we also pick you know, those questions from the public and we try to answer them into what we call a Q&A and uh, make those documents and send them down so that when the RRDCs and the DHOs go for talk shows, they actually respond to those questions. That is also what I do. Whenever I come out and I do this every week, I make statements every week. I respond. One of the very interesting ones was, uh, it wasn't only the WhatsApp scientists, even the real scientists were saying it. If you get vaccinated, no alcohol for 45 days. So everyone who took alcohol was saying, no, we are not going to get vaccinated. But that is not true. It had not been, uh, you know, said by anyone, not even the World Health Organization, because we still maintained that excessive drinking of alcohol is harmful to your health. So that one is very clear. What about the vaccine? If you take your alcohol in moderation, and because you choose that you want to take it, it is okay. It is not going to, you know, interfere with vaccination. Others came up and said if you take the vaccine, it will kill all your reproductive organs and you won't get children. And we have gone ahead to answer that the vaccines don't do this. The truth was about the blood clots and we have been answering the issues surrounding the blood clots it is very rare, one in four million people. But yes, if it occurs, it can easily be distinguished between the blood clots that occur in other groups of people and the one that is caused by the vaccine. And there is a way of treating it. And our scientists are ready to handle should it occur, but it's extremely rare. So yes, we have put in place mechanisms to respond to these myths and misconceptions. That's very important for our audience. We should continue to listen to the scientists than people who posture on our social media platforms. Uh, to bring in Marie from the civil society, specifically what are the findings in regards to vaccination perceptions? What, what are you finding out from the citizens? So um, from the citizens, the vaccination uh, perceptions are really that they are they were willing to take this in January. Of late, we haven't yet collected that uh, data, but the other concern from the citizens is that if someone gets sick at the moment, they feel that there will be less help, that they will get help less quickly. So the question maybe would be, is this linked to the home-based care? And what is it that citizens need to know more about that? Because it's quite clear that now they are worried that if you get the virus, you're really going to deal with it on your own. And if you go to a government facility, you probably won't get the help that uh, was accorded to most patients last year. Um, doctor, to bring you in, uh, there's a concern that um, AstraZeneca, whose efficacy and uh, honorable as talked about <coughs> is the vaccine of choice uh, for the low developing countries. Uh, I guess Ugandans would want to have the Pfizer vaccine and the others. And there's a concern about vaccine nationalism, that the developed world 
needs to subs subsidize some of these vaccines because they are quite expensive for us to afford and uh, prioritize you know, countries in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. Is this one of the issues uh, that you're tabling to your counterparts in the West? Uh, thank you, thank you, Emmanuel. I think, uh, number one, I, I just want to probably make the public aware that uh, the global community is very committed uh, to making sure that we have access uh, as poor countries uh, to COVID-19. WHO are uh, working through uh, CEPI, uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Interventions, Innovations, uh, set up a framework which we now commonly know as COVAX, and uh, the idea was to make sure that uh, even uh, when uh, uh, the vaccines are, 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 are costly, there is access uh, guaranteed for the poorer countries. So uh, through the COVAX framework, WHO assured that they will provide 20% uh, of uh, the vaccines free of charge. And then uh, the, the next thing is that they would help the local governments to procure another 20%. And then uh, uh, because we can't compute that you need about 60% vaccination to acquire herd immunity, uh, the other 20% we assumed would be uh, accessed through other frameworks, either the private sector or uh, the government uh, putting in money. Uh, and as you see, uh, for the sake of Uganda, the government is committed to making, to providing vaccines free for all Ugandans uh, that require the vaccine. Um, Honorable, to bring you in, um, there are a number of myths and perceptions about uh, this vaccination program. For instance, people are asking, for how long can the, this vaccine protect those who are vaccinated? Do you need one dose? Do you need two doses? Do you need three doses? Um, right now, science has shown that uh, the Astra, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, you need two doses and the doses are given between eight weeks uh, to 12 weeks apart. Um, however, even when you get a single dose, you are protected, much more protected than those who are not vaccinated. And if you get the booster dose, then the protection even, is even much more. For how long the vaccine protects is still on, the research is still ongoing. Uh, but we know that it does a good job and uh, information will be provided when it is available. We all have to know that COVID-19 is new and uh, the scientists are running a race to provide as much information as possible, not only as regards the virus, but also as regards the vaccine. So even as we are vaccinating, studies are ongoing. But if you will allow me, Allow me to answer something that came from Maria that I know may be disturbing the citizens. And this was the issue of uh, access to treatment. Yes, it is true that we rolled uh, management of COVID-19 down to the districts because Ministry of Health is not an implementing institution. We handle strategy, resource mobilization, planning, and so on. It is the districts actually that carry out the implementation. And that is why treatment and surveillance and all that is being handled by the districts. However, when the numbers overwhelmed us, that is between the months of October, November, December, and early January, we rolled over down to the communities so that we could have home-based care and it worked very well. Over 40,000 people got treatment at home. I think over 40,000 or slightly less through home-based care. 
But who follows them up during home-based care? The village health teams, because they have been trained to do this. And you know Uganda's health system begins from the village health teams who have knowledge that you know, has been imparted through training to them over the years, since the year 2001, when we introduced the concept of the village health teams. So the village health teams take care of people in the villages, and they know the families door by door. And so when somebody is sick and a village health team gets to know, that person will definitely be registered at a health center three for purposes of follow-up and for purposes of referral in the event that there is a challenge. So whether you report to the village health team or you report to the nearest health center, which is a health center three, care will still be given to you. The isolation facilities at the regional referral hospital level are majorly for moderate to severe cases. So in the event that you change condition while you are at home, you will be picked. And that is why we are now running what we call a national uh, ambulance system where ambulances are not properties of districts. They are stationed along the highways for purposes of evacuating patients and quickly taking them to the facilities. So the, 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 the isolation facilities will be available for severe cases. For mild cases, we will still manage them at home, including self-quarantine. It will still continue at home. Um, Marie, uh, to bring you up to speed, um, there's been a kind of nexus between uh, in your, um, wh what are you finding out in your study? Is there complacence between um, um, incidents of reporting some of these cases um, from the communi community cases especially uh, in the context of access to med care. I want you to speak about this and as we wrap up uh, this subject. Okay, thank you Emma. So what we, we see is that yes, when it comes to reporting the cases that we mentioned earlier that people would rather go to the health center very fast and then the call centers, they are not using that uh, as much. Maybe the question would be, is it that the call centers don't exist anymore, the hotlines for COVID-19, or what is it that needs to be done to ensure that the citizens really use that uh, a lot? Then we also do see that um, in terms of uh, what citizens think about the compliance to the uh, SOPs, they say that in the churches, these are really uh, being adhered to, but in other places, the social gatherings, this is not happening. And the suspicion is that as we get more people vaccinated, people are most likely going to relax, thinking that, ah, I got the vaccine, I don't need to really wear the mask anymore. In fact, I've had some people that is away from the data who say that I got the COVID uh, disease, and now I'm okay, I carry the plasma with me. So what is it that we can say about those? Because those people are the ones that are really trying not to wear the mask, thinking that for us we're already a mobile vaccine. Doctor, Maybe for the scientists. Yeah, in, please wrap it up in just a minute and I'll ask uh, the Honorable Minister to give her last comments. Thank, Thank you, Emma. I think uh, one thing I need to encourage Ugandans is that we should go out and get uh, our vaccines for those that fall in the vulnerable groups. We have an evolving situation uh, across the world that is uh, being complicated by uh, the emergency of variants. Uh, the vaccines are effective and safe. There might be some side effects, but every other drug has side effects and as far as the side effects for COVID-19 are concerned, we can handle, uh, you should not be scared. Uh, we are committed to fighting uh, the surge as it comes through, but we can only succeed if we work with you, uh, largely because uh, the compliance to SOPs is a very big component of the response. Thank you so much. Honorable, your last word. 
Um, first of all, allow me to thank the citizens of Uganda. All the successes that we have had with this response is largely because our citizens listen and our citizens implement what we request them to. Right now I know because of fatigue and also because of economic challenges, many people are finding it difficult to continue to implement the SOPs. But I want to appeal to you, we have a big and bad situation that is now here with us and we all must keep alive. And it is our responsibility, each and every one of us, to ensure that we stay alive and also we protect our loved ones. The vaccines right now are available for a certain group of population. Please get vaccinated. I know over the uh, past few months, the challenge has been access to these vaccines. We have now uh, provided logistics so that the health workers can have outreaches out to the villages, to the churches, and to the markets. When they get there, please do get vaccinated. And I want to reassure the population that yes, right now we only have a few doses of the vaccines, but many of you will be aware that the AstraZeneca vaccine is not only manufactured in India, it's also manufactured in uh, South Korea. And the COVAX facility is working round the clock to make sure that uh, African countries have access to these vaccines in this month of May. Similarly, the World Health Organization is approving many other vaccines from different countries. And uh, the, the Chinese vaccine uh, could have been approved yesterday or will be approved early next week. And uh, we will also bring the Chinese vaccine into the country. So as the vaccines are approved, we will continue to make them available to the people. The vaccination program may extend a little longer beyond 2021, but also the pandemic may not go away very quickly. And so we will continue vaccinating the population as vaccines become available. Please continue to practice the standard operating procedures. And now that we have variants in the country, my appeal to you is to be on high alert, extremely, as you were before. Because before, when you would notice any foreigner within your vicinity, you would report. If you will do that again, we would greatly appreciate, because we need to get them out. They may be the carrier of the variants that we are talking about, so that we can in investigate. But also, if you notice clusters of infections, please do inform us or, in, or inform the district surveillance officers so that they can reach out to such populations and investigate. Together, we can do it. And the power to ensure that our country is not thrown off balance into a bad situation is in our hands. Let's rise up together as Ugandans to fight COVID-19 and to protect the citizens. I thank you.